Let me invite you to open in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 24. I was watching a movie the other day called Surrender. It was the story about a young black man named Jay Harden. Jay Harden was a man who had all kinds of trouble. The movie began by him and his family going to their mother-in-law's house or his mother-in-law's house to celebrate Thanksgiving. And you could tell that Jay had some problems because hurting people hurt others. And as his children began to do what children do, they was singing and playing in the back seat there. Jay went off on the kids. Jay began to fuss at them and yell at them and scream at them. And then his wife began to try to calm him down. And Jay began to fuss at his wife. And uh, oh, they got into a, a big argument. And so uh, that was not a happy trip as they was driving along. When they finally made it to his mother-in-law's house, a place that he really didn't want to go. Well, to make a long story short, uh, he began to uh, show his dissatisfaction at the Thanksgiving table. He began to erupt and just go off on all of his in-laws, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, mom-in-law, dad-in-law, just, just went off on them and they tried to calm him down and they uh, said they are two cents, do they two cents in? And it was just a big ugly scene. So Jay just jumped up and Jay says, I'm packing my bag, let's pack our bags and let's go. We're heading out in the morning. And so they cut the trip short and they headed on back home that following morning. Not long after that, Jay got a phone call from the bank and the bank was telling them that they're going to have to foreclose on his business if he did not uh, come up with those payments. He was three months behind. And uh, Jay had an appliance store. And so Jay didn't know how he was going to get this money. And so uh, he was having problems uh, there at his job. He was about to lose his business. But he was also having problems with this marriage. He was about to lose his wife. And so as Jay was making a delivery uh, with one of his routemans taking a, uh, a television to one of the customers. Jay saw a nice house in this very expensive neighborhood and it had just came on the market and so Jay uh, approached the real estate lady because she was still there at the house and he took one of those flowers and so Jay went back to his office and uh, uh, he called uh, the bank and began to uh, try to fill out an application to try to buy that house. He said this is just that thing I need to fix up my marriage. I can get this house. This would be a great Christmas present for my wife. Well, uh, his application was denied because he did not uh, have enough income. But Jay was a wheeler and a dealer. He, he began to come up with another plan. And so he took his wife out on a date. And they hadn't been out on a date in a long, long time. Matter of fact, they went to one of the most expensive restaurants in town. And so they was, had dressed up. They were smelling good, looking good. They're at this expensive restaurant, eating this expensive food. And so his wife said, come on, tell me, what's really up? Uh, I know you didn't uh, dress us up like this to come to this uh, restaurant. Uh, come on, tell me, what's really, really up? And so he began to go in his pocket and he took out this flyer that he had of this $650,000 home that he wanted to buy for her. Uh, and this was going to be her Christmas 
present, but he, he needed her help in order to get it, that she would have to return to work. Oh, boy. Uh, when he made mention of that, uh, she was very upset because she said, you thought that you could buy my love by just buying this house for me. And then you couldn't even really buy the house. Uh, I'm going to have to help you buy the house. But that was not the deal. You said that uh, when the kids come, I could stay at home while they was going through elementary school and I would not have to work until after they got out of elementary school. And so she just stormed on out of there and she left out and uh, he left out behind and they was in a real big argument as they was driving home. But then all of a sudden, uh, she was getting ready to tell him that we can't get this house anyway because I'm getting ready to file for a divorce. But before she could get it out, the telephone rung and he picked up his telephone and it was a call from the house. Uh, the paramedics was letting him know that his daughter, his nine-year-old daughter had fallen from the second floor back and then she had hit her head against the a piano and they was rushing her to the hospital and so they uh, Jay and his wife they met him up there at the hospital and they began to talk to the doctor and the doctor let him know that uh, uh, she has uh, the daughter has some real serious head injuries and they don't know for sure if she would ever walk again. Jay and his wife was really, really crushed. And the next scene we see is that Jay uh, found them way, his way to the church house. And there at the church house, all by himself, he was there praying and asking God to heal his daughter. But after uh, he had left the church, he began to go on and walk and, and just talk to the Lord. And as he was walking, it began to rain and he began to to look up and he began to cry out to the Lord and ask God to uh, have mercy on him. And he began to uh, confess his sins to Almighty God, that he hadn't been a good father, he hadn't been a good uh, husband, and he hadn't been a good man, and he hadn't been a, a good servant to him. And he said, Lord, uh, uh, I'm about to lose my uh, uh, job, I'm about to lose my business, but if I lose my business, that's okay. And it says, and look like I'm about to lose my marriage, but if I lose my marriage, that's okay. He, he, he said, but the only thing, I don't want to lose you, oh God. I surrender. I give you my life. I want you to take my life. I want you to mold my life, shake my life, use my life. I just don't want to lose you, oh God. And what the J. Wells story tells us is that sometimes God has to chasten his children severely before they surrender to him. A case in point of that is in our lesson today in Jeremiah chapter 24. Look at Jeremiah chapter 24, beginning with the first three verses. The Bible says, uh, the Lord showed me and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jehoiada and the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, uh, with the craftsmen and the smith from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What said thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the bad figs, very bad, that cannot be eaten, they are so bad. So the Lord shows Jeremiah down at the temple, there was two baskets 
of figs, one basket of good figs, one basket of bad figs. Now, I couldn't find no figs, but I found some bananas. So I got one basket of good bananas, and I got one basket of rotten bananas. They are so rotten, I can't even hardly hold them up. I, they, they've broken the pieces here. But they are rotten. You can see how they done turned black. They are rotten bananas. A basket of rotten fruit. Now, somebody may ask the question, what do that mean? What do the good figs in the basket mean? What do the bad figs in the basket mean? I'm pretty sure Jeremiah asked that question. Some of you probably asking the same question. Glad that you asked and God gives us the answer. He tells us first of all in verses 4 through 7 about the good figs. Look what he says in verse number four. He gives us the explanation of what the good figs are. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldees, for their good. Now notice, God tells Jeremiah, those good figs represent the people that had been carried away into the land of Chaldees, in other words, to Babylon. See, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had sent his army they are to Jerusalem three times. The first time that he sent them was in 605 B.C. And then he sent them again in 597 B.C. And then he sent them the third time, 586 B.C., and he destroyed Jerusalem, destroying the temple, and destroying the king and his palace. But he's talking about right here in our text, the first time that he came. The first time that he came, he took away some prisoners. And God is letting Jeremiah know that the people that went with King Nebuchadnezzar back to Babylon, they are to be treated like they are good fruit, a basket of good fruit. Now, they, why did God call them good? Well, when you look at it from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective, he called them good because uh, he took the good people. He took those that was uh, useful. When you look at your text, Verse number one, at the end of verse one, the Bible says he took the craftsmen. Those were some carpenters. And he took the smiths. Those was the blacksmith. Those people that could make swords and spears and horseshoes and what have you. Uh, 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 battle armor and battle equipment. That's what the smith could make. And remember, he also took, according to chapter nine, he took those that was wise. He took the educated people. That's why Jeremiah told him, uh, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. And then he took the, uh, uh, the rich people. And he says, let not the rich man boast in his riches. And he took the powerful people, uh, the big shots in the neighborhood. And he said, let not the mighty man boast in his might. So he had taken those people because of their usefulness. But that was not so much why God was looking at them being good. God was looking at them being good because they had surrendered. They had surrendered to the will 
of God. Think, think, think about it. Jeremiah had been preaching that if y'all surrender and just go on with Nebuchadnezzar, everything was going to be all right. And so God looked at those people as those that had surrendered to his will like a basket of fruit. They was prisoners that had been taken out of the promised land. And God says that they are good because they had surrendered. And matter of fact, because they surrendered, good things was going to happen to them. Look, look here uh, at verse 6. He says, For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pluck, I mean, pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and that they shall be my people and I'll be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Notice God says some good things is going to uh, happen for those people but all because they had surrendered to him. Now this was the chastisement of God. But the Bible teaches us whom the Lord loves, he's chasing it. Matter of fact, let me show you that. Because some of you may be experiencing the chastisement of God. But over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning with verse number 6, the Bible says, for whom the Lord loves, he chasing it and scourge every son whom he received. Listen, if you are experiencing the chastening of the Lord today, cheer up my brothers and sisters, because whom the Lord loveth, he said, God loves you. He loves you enough to correct you. In other words, God love you enough to not leave you alone in your sins. Look at verse 7. He says, if you endure the chastening, if you hang on in there, if you don't rebel against the chastening, if, if you just go on and surrender to the chastening, God deal with you as a son for whom, for, the, for, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? See, that's one of the ways you know that you are in the family of God. God treats you like you one of his sons. But verse number eight, but if ye be without chast chastisement of which all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. So God was dealing with these people like they was his sons and because they surrendered, to the will of God, God says some good things are going to happen to you. And so God shows Jeremiah the basket of good fruit represent the basket of those people, those prisoners that had been taken out of the promised land. But notice he tells Jeremiah what the basket of bad figs represent. Look here at verse number 8 through 10. He says, And like the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad, surely thus said the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem, that remain, keep that word in mind, remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdom of the earth for their hurt to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt, and a curse in all places which I shall drive them. Uh, notice, God says, uh, I'm going to bring judgment on them 
And it's not going to be for their good, but it's going to be for their hurt. And I'm going to not bless them, but I'm going to curse them. And I'm not going to be sending them to a foreign land. He says, I'm going to be driving them. The other day, it was a mangy dog out there. And I thought that I had a flashback whenever a mangy dog would come around our house. We used to take rocks and stuff and start throwing rocks at the mangy dog and drive that mangy dog on off of our property. And this is what God is saying. God is saying, because these people are rotten, he says, I'm going to drive them away from me. Verse 10, he says, and I will send the sword, uh, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Now, this a vision was an eye-opening thing because in Jeremiah's near mind and the people that was left there in Jerusalem, they thought that those prisoners that had been taken out of the promised land back to the Chaldees to Babylon, they thought they was in bad shape. But God is letting Jeremiah know, no, no, they in good shape. But the people that remain, they the one that's in bad shape. As a matter of fact, see, the people thought that they was in real good shape. Now, you think about it. If you see people being marched off with chain uh, around their hands, wrists, chains around their ankles, chains around their waist, chained to somebody else. You would think that these people was in bad shape. And a lot of times they would strip these people naked uh, or they would strip them down uh, to where they didn't have uh, nothing to cover their uh, bottoms. And they would be walked. That was an embarrassing thing. That was a, a shameful thing. Matter of fact, these people that remain in the land was thinking, whoo, I'm glad I'm not a prisoner. Them people shouldn't have surrendered. They went on and they surrendered. And because they done surrendered, bad things is getting ready to happen to them. No, God says bad things are getting ready to happen to y'all that didn't surrender. Those who are staying there, bad things are getting ready to happen to them. But in those people's mind, they are thinking that, man, things are going good for us. Just look at what all we got now. Look at all this stuff that we done inherited from the people who done went to Babylon. Look at all this stuff they left behind. Now, we got farmlands that used to then be our farmland that those people left behind. We got crops that we didn't even plant that those people done left behind. We got animals, we got horses that we got now that those people done left behind. Uh, uh, we got donkeys that those people done left behind. Uh, we got oxen that those people done left behind. Uh, we got clothes that those people done left behind. We got jewelry that those people done left behind. We got monies that those people done left behind. We got houses and land. We got a whole bunch of stuff that those people done left behind. We can sit back, relax. Oh, we can take it easy now. But they didn't know what was getting ready to hit them. Notice, God was getting ready to send a sword there. When, when it's God talking about a sword, in other words, war was getting ready to come. And after the war, it was going to be famine. There was going to be, in other words, food shortage. As a matter of fact, when you read your Bible over in 2 Kings, it talks about how things got so bad that those people had to start drinking their own tea tea and had to start eating their own boo boo. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible talks about how they was even buying and selling dove, the bird boo boo. And that was a delicatessen, ladies and gentlemen. And, 
as a result, these people was eating stuff that they had no business eating. Matter of fact, the Bible even showed how they was eating their own children. Children weren't even safe because folks didn't have nothing to eat. And so folks would have them a little boy to eat or they was having little girls they eat. They would eat one of their kids one day and they would eat somebody else's kids the next day. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, and because they weren't eating the right thing, all kind of diseases start breaking out. And as a result, uh, God began to start sending even greater disease, greater pestilence, and all kind of diseases began to wipe them out. So in other words, if the sword didn't get them, the famine would. And if the famine didn't get them, the pestilence would. See, these people, they thought that they had it made in the shade, but they didn't know that they was getting ready to experience hell right here on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, when I look at this chapter, chapter 24, what I really see, ladies and gentlemen, is a picture of things to come. I believe God has given us a picture of what is to come. When God looks at this world today, you know what he see? He see two hand baskets. He see a basket that's full of rotten fruit, and he sees a basket that's full of good fruit. And one day, Jesus Christ is going to come back, ladies and gentlemen. The next thing that's on God's calendar, the next major thing is the rapture of the church. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to come and he's going to take up all of the good people and he's going to take them to heaven with him. When he take them up into heaven, it's going to be a family reunion up there in heaven. Now keep in mind, these people that goes up in the rapture, the church, they are good not because they've been so holy. They are good not because they've been so righteous. They are good not because they've been so good, but it was all because they surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. They gave their life to Jesus. They told Jesus, you can take my life and use me in your service. So they are good because they surrendered to Almighty God. And once we leave this planet in the rapture, all these folks that remain, they're going to feel sorry for us because they don't really know what done happened to us. But when, as they look around, they're going to see millions of, may even be billions of people that done left. But they left a whole bunch of stuff behind. They done left houses behind. So somebody them done got these houses that these raptured people done left behind. These folks going to start getting cars that these raptured people done left behind. Oh, they going to get land that these rapture people done left behind. They going to get clothes that these rapture people done left behind. They going to get jewelry that these rapture people done left behind. They going to get stocks and bonds and mutual funds that these rapture people done left behind. They going to get big bank accounts that these rapture people done left behind and they going to think that they got it made in the shade. We just going to relax, sit back and take it easy the rest of my life. But this is just the calm before the storm. Oh, God is getting ready, ladies and gentlemen, to send a sword after them. What is I'm talking about? The Bible says it's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be one war after the next war, and the wars are going to get bigger. The wars are going to get bigger, and then as a result, you're going to have famine in the land. Folks won't be able to go down to Kroger. Folks won't be able to go to no Walmart, and folks going to start drinking their own tea tea. They're going to start eating their own boo-boo, and because people are drinking their own tea tea and, and eating their own boo-boo, then they're going to start getting all kind of diseases and sick people make other people sick. And then if, if that a famine don't get you, 
and your own sickness don't get you, then God going to start sending one plague after the next. We think AIDS is bad. Uh, we think that uh, uh, Ebola is bad. We think that the coronavirus is bad. We ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, the stuff that God has got planned for those folks that won't surrender to him, God is going to send the sword, he's going to send the famine, he's going to send the pestilence. In other words, it's going to be hell on earth. So what do you do with rotten food? What do you do with rotten food? You throw rotten food away because you can't use no rotten food. But what do you do with rotten people? God has got a place for rotten people that he called hell. And he's going to send them to hell in a handbasket. That's where we get the phrase, they're going to hell in a handbasket. And God is sending them to hell in a handbasket. Now keep in mind why they went to hell in the handbasket. They went to hell not because they were so unholy. They went to hell not because they were so unrighteous, they went to hell because they didn't surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. If they would have surrendered to Jesus, Jesus would have paid for their sin. But because they didn't surrender to Jesus, they got to pay for their own sins. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what can we learn? What lessons can we learn from this story? Let me give you four lessons right quick that we can learn from this story. Number one, God blesses those that surrender to his will. God blesses those that surrender to his will. Look at five and six again. At the end of verse five, God says, for their good. Verse six, I will set mine eyes upon them. God said, I'm going to look at them for good. That's why the Bible says when you surrender to God, all things work together for the good. That's the first thing. God blesses those that surrender to his will. Number two, God has a wonderful plan for those who surrender to his will. God has a wonderful plan for those that surrender to his will. Look at 6b. He says, and I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. God has a wonderful plan for those that surrender to his will. Number three. God changes the hearts of those that surrender to his will. God changes the heart of those that surrender to his will. Verse 7, and I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I'll be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. God changes the heart of those that surrender to his will. And then the final thing, God judges those that refuse to surrender to his will. God judges those that refuse to surrender to his will. Notice verse 9, God says, for their hurt. Later on, he says, for a curse. Verse 10 says, I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. God judges those that refuses to surrender to his will. Where are you at in this story? Are you in that basket of good fruit? You're good. 
not because you live in good, but because you surrendered to the will of God. Or are you in that other basket a rotten fruit? And you're rotten not because you're worse than everybody else. No, you're rotten because you didn't surrender. You didn't surrender to the will of God. My challenge to you today is that you surrender to the will of God. You know, I used to watch this show Gunsmoke. And what I like about Marshall Dillon, when the outlaws would come to town and they would mess up Dodge and Matt would get on their trail. And when Matt would finally catch up with them. What I like about Marshall Dillon, Matt would tell them, you surrounded, come out with your hands up. He would always give them a chance to surrender. That's what I like about God. God just don't come in and destroy you. God just give you a chance to surrender. So come out today with your hands up and surrender to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Take this word and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. giving you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So if you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior, just bow your head. Pray this short prayer with me. Father, I have sinned. Come short of your glory. Forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe with all my heart that you have raised him from the dead. Thank you, dear God, for saving me. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit so that I can live a surrender life to you the rest of my life. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. All right. Welcome to the family. Go tell somebody now about that decision that you have just made because you have made the greatest decision and the best decision that you, a person can ever make. Now, at the end of the broadcast, we're going to give some contact information. We would love it for you to contact us and let us know about that decision. If you are in need of a church home, we would love to have you. 
as one of our members right here at Bible Way Community Baptist Church. All right, so uh, God bless you. May God keep you is our prayer. And like I say, there's some contact information. Make sure that you contact us and let us know. All right, family, that's it. That's it for today. Go out and make this a great day in the Lord. And remember, God love you, and so do I. And there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. God bless you, family. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy God. Let me feel that Holy Spirit. this time we want to prepare our hearts to worship our Lord in Holy Communion time. We ask that those of you who are at home, if you would go and get your grape juice and get your uh, crackers and celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, as often as you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you show that you have faith in me until I come again. So we'll give you an opportunity to get those elements. And first we will have a song by the male chorus. Oh 
Amen. Thank the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Jesus, you may be seated as we prepare our hearts now to worship our Lord in Holy Communion. Jesus, on the last night with his disciple, he took bread and he blessed it. And he says, this bread is my body of the New Testament that is broken for you and for many. He says, as often as you eat of it, you show that you have faith in him until he comes again. Let me consecrate it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread symbolizing the broken body of Jesus. I ask that you will consecrate it and consecrate all of those this morning that is going to participate with us in Holy Communion. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us eat it together. Then after supper, they took a cup. Jesus said that this blood that is shed is shed for you and for many. As often as you drink of it, you also show that you have faith in me until I come again. Hold up your cup as we consecrate these elements of the juice this morning. Heavenly Father, we offer up before you this juice symbolizing the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would consecrate it, and as we partake of it, consecrate our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us drink it together, brethren. Amen. And the scripture says after they ate and drank, they went out singing. Now, I don't know exactly what song they went out singing, but here at Bible Way we sing, I know it was the blood. So sing it with us at home, I know it was the blood. And I know it was the blood for me. Well, they whipped them all night long. They whipped them all night long. They whipped them all night long for me. Well, one day, Jesus died. said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. Well, one day, Jesus died. Tear 
pierce them in its side. They pierce them in its side. They pierce them in its side. For me. Oh, I'm big. Jesus. screaming down the blood came screaming down the blood came screaming down Well, that concludes our Sunday morning worship service as well as our communion service. We hope something was said, something was done to help you and encourage you on your Christian journey. And please tune in next Sunday as we bring another message and another worship service in the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.